Hello and welcome to Real Cheating Story. It all started as a common story of infidelity. I was preparing for a business trip, heading to my private plane, when I received a call that I wasn't needed. I turned the plane back into the hangar, knowing I needed in the coming days, and parked it before heading back. I checked in with my boss, and we decided I could take the rest of the day off. It was almost 4 o'clock, and by the time I got home, it would be nearly 5.30, about the time my wife usually returned. I planned to surprise her and take her out to dinner. I was right about the surprise, but she surprised me even more. It seemed that as soon as she learned I was leaving, she and her friend made plans for the evening and left work early to get a head start. When I saw her car alongside another unfamiliar vehicle in the garage, I feared the worst. I cautiously entered the house, and, as expected, I found evidence of their hurried activities, shoes scattered by the back door, a blouse on the steps, and other clothing items leading to the spare bedroom. The door was left ajar in their haste. I entered to find them naked, he was standing by the bed while she, my loving wife, was on her knees. His audible pleasure was clear, and though I was somewhat mentally prepared for the sight, it still shocked me. For those who might think I enjoyed this in any way, you're mistaken. My wife, whom I trusted and admired, was engaged in an intimate act with another man. I struggled to control my emotions and resist the urge to react violently. When he decided he was done and instructed her to lie on the bed, I cleared my throat, making my presence known. What are you doing here? I asked sharply. And who is this? The man's face shifted from pleasure to panic. He stammered, I thought you were out of town. I looked into my wife's eyes, seeing a depth of realization I hadn't seen before. I want you to grab him and follow me downstairs, I commanded. I retrieved his phone from where it had been discarded and checked the contacts. I dialed a number labeled home, and a woman answered, slightly breathless. Hi, Mark, she said, seeing the caller ID. I just got home, so don't try to tell me you're running late again. I replied, Mark won't be making any excuses tonight. Let me explain why he isn't calling you from his cell. Don't worry, he isn't injured, at least not yet. I suggest you come over to my house. I just caught Mark with his, in my wife's mouth. The woman's shocked response was, what the? Who are you? I had a suspicion something was off. But this? Are you sure? I never want to see him again. I'll handle it myself. Where do you live? I provided her with my address and advised her to drive safely. We wouldn't want anything bad to happen, I said. If anyone deserves to be hurt here, it's certainly not you. Clicking the button, I turned my attention back to the pair in my living room. Stand over there in front of the window, I instructed. I don't think so, Mark objected. June, however, calmly walked to the spot I had indicated, dragging Mark along. His cries of pain were audible. Damn, June, let go already. She won't be letting go until I command her to, I said with a hint of authority. You see, there are things about me that you don't know. Hell, June doesn't even know. I smirked slightly. It seems we have a bit of time before your wife arrives, so let me enlighten you both. Their faces displayed a mix of curiosity and fear. Until I was about 18 years old, I led a perfectly normal life. I'm average in height, weight, appearance, brown hair, brown eyes, and medium skin tone. I'm not particularly handsome, but not unattractive either, wouldn't you agree? It was around that time I discovered I had a unique ability. If I looked someone in the eye for a few seconds, I could plant a thought in their mind. This could range from something innocent, like your name is now Bert, to something far more intense, such as if you don't follow my instructions, you'll be engulfed by a fire so hot that hell would seem cool in comparison. The last example is what I've implanted in June's mind. As you can imagine, I had a lot of fun with this ability, especially once I perfected it. For instance, there was a bully from high school whom I made believe it was acceptable to moon the entire graduation crowd. 
I've played many pranks and used my power to avoid minor trouble with the police. I've also used it to have memorable evenings with women, ensuring that if they initially rejected me, they would change their minds and engage in activities that would make even an adult film star blush. One notable incident involved the daughter of a local Air Force general. When her mother walked in on us, I was struck by her attractiveness. I persuaded her to join us, but the general arrived before we were done. He intervened aggressively, but I managed to explain that I could influence people's thoughts deeply, more effectively than hypnosis. Homeland Security saw the potential for interrogation and intelligence gathering. I negotiated a deal with them, a six-figure salary, a small plane, and they would maintain it as long as I performed certain tasks. My official job title is Troubleshooter, which explains any sudden calls to action. Another part of the deal was to stop using my abilities for personal gain. Eventually, I found that I preferred genuine connections with people who like me for who I am, not because I manipulated them. June was an exception to this preference, and now, I'm facing the consequences. We had talked about starting a family soon, but with everything going on, I'm eager to find out what's really been happening. I glared at Mark while we waited. Deciding to gather some photographic evidence of their affair for potential future use, I instructed June to kiss him and caress his chest while I took pictures. I snapped about a dozen shots before I heard a car pull up in the driveway. I commanded her to stop and return to standing by the window. Setting my camera down, I went to the door and opened it just as she was about to ring the doorbell. I take it that you're Mark's wife? I greeted her. I'm Cliff Daringer, and I believe that is your husband Mark standing next to my wife June. I wish I could say it was nice to meet you, Darlene replied, glancing at the scene before her. She walked over to Mark, who cast his eyes downward, then stood in front of June, who also looked down in shame. Darlene smacked Mark across the cheek, causing his head to whip to the side. Have you no shame? Couldn't you at least put some clothes on? Darlene, that's my fault, I said. I thought it would make them feel some shame and regret for what they did, not just for getting caught. Look at that, Darlene commented. She won't even let go of him. What kind of shameless woman did you marry, Cliff? Again, that's my fault, I responded. It makes him easier to control. Watch this. June, squeezes. Why did you do that? Mark interrupted, his voice strained. What did I do to you, he added. That's your stupid question, June replied. Ease up on the grip, but hold on. I briefly caught Mark's eye, which was all I needed. I want you both to tell us the truth now, I instructed. No spinning things to make yourselves look better. You will tell us everything, no half-truths. Let's start with Mark. What's the story here? Mark began, we first met back in high school. The possibility of this affair starting before our marriages entered both Darlene's and my own minds. We began dating in January of our senior year, just after the second semester started. June and I were from different crowds, so we hadn't met before that. When we sat near each other in our science class, we hit it off. We were steady almost from the beginning and spent as much time together as we could. It was just after Easter break that we first, you know, in the back seat of my car. After that, we were inseparable and never had a major argument. I was completely in love. Then she left. It was May 2nd. I remember it well. I went to pick her up for school and her dad told me she was gone and not coming back. He told me to leave and never ask about her again. I was heartbroken and thought she had run away from me. I couldn't understand what I had done wrong. I kept returning, begging for information about her whereabouts or reasons for leaving. Her parents wouldn't tell me anything and threatened to call the police if I returned. They did call the police, who took me to the station and discussed the situation with me. My folks came, and the officer released me with a warning that I'd be arrested if I went back. I was devastated and alone. I finished my senior year and joined the army for four years to escape my pain and loneliness. While in the army, 
I met Darlene and married her, thinking I'd never see June again. When I got out, we moved back here about six months ago. A few months later, I bumped into June at the grocery store. We had coffee to catch up, which was innocent at first, with only minor flirting. But two weeks ago, I came over one afternoon when you were away, and things got out of control. We both swore it would never happen again, but it did a week later, and today is only the third time. We are both very sorry and didn't mean to hurt either of you. Okay, June, now let's hear your side of the story. The first part is just as he said, June began. We met during our senior year of high school and dated for several months. Everything was wonderful until I took a pregnancy test after missing my period. I sat there on the end of my bed, tears streaming down my face as I held the pregnancy test. When my mom walked in and saw why I was crying, I panicked and tried to hide the test, but she noticed it. She was upset but comforted me until dad came home. Dad's reaction was quite the opposite, he was furious. After he calmed down a bit, he said he would arrange for an abortion and that we should tell no one, especially not Mark. I insisted that I couldn't go through with it, that it was my body and my decision. This led to another heated argument. Eventually, we compromised. I could carry the baby to term and put it up for adoption, but I couldn't tell anyone about it. I had to leave that night for my Aunt Janice's home in South Dakota, which is a seven-hour drive. I was instructed not to call anyone here, not even Mark to say goodbye. That was one of Dad's unyielding conditions. If anyone found out, he would disown me and expel me from the family. So, you have a child out there somewhere that you never mentioned to me? I asked June. June replied, I went to Aunt Janice's and finished the school year there. I couldn't attend any classes that fall because I would be showing, which would violate our agreement. As I started to show, I became isolated in her home, with no contact with friends or other family members except for mom and dad, and I was so upset I didn't even speak to them. My world became my aunt, myself, and the child growing within me. I think my depression worsened when I was about six months along. When I got past that, I returned home only to find that Mark had joined the army and his family had moved away, having only stayed until his graduation. I felt so awful that I moped around the house for months until Dad convinced me to get a job to help me move on. I worked at Dr. Jensen's office and began dating after a while. About a year later, I met you, Cliff. Our life together was wonderful and made me forget all about Mark until we ran into each other in the grocery store. Well, isn't that just a sweet and innocent tale, Darlene remarked with a snide tone. A tale of teenage love, lust, and betrayal. You both promised to love each other, and if this is how you show your love, I should return the favor by kicking you both. So, were you planning to leave us for each other, or what? No, Cliff, June replied quickly. I love you. I didn't want to leave you. Mark looked surprised that he wasn't June's first choice, but said nothing. So, did you think I would accept your affair, or did you think you could have your cake and eat it too? Cliff continued. Did you really believe that you could cheat on me with Mark, giving him what is rightfully mine, as long as he wanted it? June responded, I didn't really think it through like that. I didn't want to leave you unless Mark left Darlene. I guess I didn't fully realize how much it would hurt you. Cliff asked, What do you think, Darlene? Do I have a loving wife or what? Darlene answered, I can't say I'm any better off. Mark and I were dating for about a year when I got pregnant with Joey, our son. Now I wonder if that's the only reason he married me. He was obviously still holding onto feelings for June. Mark looked surprised when June mentioned that she didn't want to leave Cliff. Mark began reluctantly, I haven't thought it through completely. I didn't want to leave you and Joey either, but part of me thought maybe June and I could make it work. It hurt a bit that she expressed her love and loyalty to him. I guess I thought she should only feel that way about me since I had never met Cliff. It was easy to pretend he didn't exist and that June and I could just pick up where we left off in high school. I'm very confused because I still love you too, Darlene. Cliff concluded, they didn't betray each other, 
but they definitely betrayed us both. June and Mark started to protest this, but as they considered Darlene's observation, June clarified, it's a different kind of love. It's not more for one and less for the other. The love I have for Cliff is a mature, trusting love, a comfortable love. When I'm with Mark, I experience the intense emotions of first love, which never had the chance to fully develop. Do you remember when we married and took vows in front of many people to love and cherish each other, forsaking all others? You made a promise to love only me, and I promised to love only you. I don't recall a clause that allowed for any indiscretions. So, what other promises have you broken? Have you always been faithful to me since we married? Yes, June responded. That seems to call for more explanation. Have you ever done more than just flirt with someone else? Not since we were married, June said. What about when we were dating? Well, when we began dating, we weren't exclusive. I was still seeing someone else when you asked me out. I continued seeing him until we agreed to be exclusive. I didn't tell you about a few occasions when we met up just for physical intimacy. I felt bad about it because I had just ended things with him for you. So, you started lying and cheating on me almost from the beginning. How many times did this happen? We only met up a few times, June said. They didn't mean anything to me. They sure mean something to me, Cliff replied. They mean that you were unfaithful and deprived me of the time we could have spent together. No, Cliff, June said. These instances were only on nights when you were away on business. We wouldn't have been together anyway. That means you had to contact him to arrange these meetings. Even if you convinced yourself it was just a mutual arrangement, you initiated it. It sounds like premeditated cheating to me. It wasn't like that, June said, but her head hung in silence. When did you finally end things with him and why? The last time was four months before we got married. It was a farewell meeting because he was transferred to another city. Before that, our last meeting was just two months after we started dating. So, it could have continued as long as an excuse was available, couldn't it? I was really just trying to make sense of it all, June said, her voice breaking. Cliff turned to Darlene. Is there anything else you need to confess? June's head shot up in anger at the remark but then lowered in shame. I have one more confession. On the night of my bachelorette party, I got quite drunk. They hired a male dancer for a private performance, and things got a bit out of hand. My maid of honor joined us, and we were both quite worked up. I ended up being intimate with him in that room, right in front of Jenny. I know now that I shouldn't have trusted her, and I regret it deeply. I realize now that my actions have shown a lack of respect for our vows, and I'm truly sorry. Darlene turned to Mark. Mark, have there been any times you haven't shared with Darlene that you're not proud of? Have you done anything with my wife that you wouldn't have done if she were around? I went out with another girl once while we were dating, but we weren't exclusive yet, Mark admitted. I have flirted a bit over the years, but I haven't done anything I'm really ashamed of. This situation just happened, it got out of control. We didn't want to hurt either of you. Darlene responded, being sorry doesn't fix everything. I agree, Cliff said, his anger evident. I believe Mark didn't plan for this to happen, but my wife seems to have a pattern of behavior that suggests she struggles with fidelity. I've made it clear that I won't tolerate infidelity. Cliff's anger grew as he continued. Wasn't our sex life good enough for you? We were intimate at least three times a week, usually four. How often did I get leftovers after you were with Mark? Even if you cleaned up, it was still like receiving something that was already used. Was my affection not enough? Or did you just crave something different? The love I have for Cliff is a mature, trusting love, a comfortable love. When I'm with Mark, I experience the intense feelings of first love, which never had the chance to fully develop. Do you remember when we married and took vows in front of many people to love and cherish each other, forsaking all others? You made a promise to love only me, and I promised to love only you. I don't recall any clause that allowed for infidelity. So, what other promises have you broken? 
Have you always been faithful to me since we married? Yes, June replied. That seems to call for more explanation. Have you ever done more than just flirt with someone else? Not since we were married, June said. What about when we were dating? Well, when we began dating, we weren't exclusive. I was still seeing someone else when you asked me out. I continued seeing him until we agreed to be exclusive. I didn't tell you about a few instances when we met up just for physical intimacy. I felt bad about it because I had just ended things with him for you. So, you started lying and cheating on me almost from the beginning. How many times did this happen? We only met up a few times, June said. They didn't mean anything to me. They mean something to me, Cliff replied. They show that you were unfaithful and deprived me of the time we could have spent together. No, Cliff, June said. These instances were only on nights when you were away on business. We wouldn't have been together anyway. That means you had to contact him to arrange these meetings. Even if you convinced yourself it was just a mutual arrangement, you initiated it. It sounds like premeditated cheating to me. It wasn't like that, June said, but her head hung in silence. When did you finally end things with him and why? The last time was four months before we got married. It was a farewell meeting because he was transferred to another city. Before that, our last meeting was just two months after we started dating. So, it could have continued as long as an excuse was available, couldn't it? June's eyes were filled with tears. I wish things had been different. I love you, Cliff. I regret the way things turned out and how they've affected our relationship. Is this about me not giving you enough attention? Cliff asked. I'm not out of town more than occasionally. When I'm away, I make a special effort to make our time together meaningful. I've tried to make our life together as good as I could. Wasn't that enough for you? It wasn't about you, Cliff, June said through her tears. It was about Mark and me and our unresolved relationship. You were a wonderful husband. I must have been mistaken if you thought my actions were an indication that I didn't care about you. So, did you think I was just a provider, someone you could disregard when a better opportunity came along? Am I just a stepping stone to something better? No, Cliff, June said. When I married you, it was because I loved you and wanted to spend my life with you. I still do. I regret that this situation happened. It's interesting that you refer to this as an accident, Cliff said. You brought him into our home, into our sanctuary. It shows a lack of respect. June looked at Cliff with pleading eyes. Is there still a chance for us, Cliff? I really do love you. I think in time, I might be able to forgive you, Cliff said. But I'll never forget this. It will take a long time before I can begin to trust you again. Can you live with me constantly checking up on you, monitoring who you're with and what you're doing? It goes without saying that Mark can never be part of our lives again. This is a choice you need to make right now. I don't want to force you to be loyal through threats, Cliff continued. I want to be with someone who genuinely wants to be with me, who will be faithful. I need to know if you truly want this, if you want it more than anything else. June hesitated, looking between Mark and Cliff. That's a big decision. Your hesitation tells me a lot. It suggests you might not love me more than him, and even if you choose me, you might soon regret your decision. June tried to move toward Cliff but forgot that her hand was still touching Mark, pulling him across the room. She realized and stopped, dropping to her knees in tears. Please, Cliff, give me another chance. You made your choices, Cliff said. You'll have to live with the consequences. Darlene then addressed Mark. Mark, it looks like June might be available soon. Do you want to stay with your family or try to be with her? If you want to stay with her, you'll need to prove you're worth keeping around. Assuming you want to stay with me, I continued, you need to really want it. I'm sorry, Darlene. Darlene broke down, placing her face in her hands and slumping on the couch. Fine. I said. Now we see everyone's true colors, don't we? 
Some people, when faced with a situation like this, might resort to violence or humiliation. They might get a gun and resort to drastic measures, or publicly shame both parties involved. But that's not who I am. The tension in the room eased slightly. You both will face consequences, I said. June, if you recall, my job required a prenup due to the nature of my work. Your first punishment is that you'll receive only a fraction of our joint assets. If you'd managed to stay longer, you might have received more, but you couldn't even reach our second anniversary. The prenup stated that if either of us cheated, we'd receive either $10,000 or 5% of our total worth, whichever is less, for each year of loyalty. After 10 years, we would split evenly, but the plane is exempted, of course. You can have the bed where this happened, because I sure don't want it. Secondly, as part of his punishment, I continued, you cost him to lose his ability to father children or engage in sexual activity, and you will live with that knowledge. Mark's punishment is that he will face significant physical limitations. I didn't elaborate further, but the implication was clear. Darlene looked at us with a mix of confusion and disbelief. Come with me to the kitchen, I whispered, leading her out of the room. In the kitchen, I explained that I had used a form of mental influence to ensure that Mark's actions would have lasting repercussions. This may seem drastic, but Mark's actions warranted a strong response. I haven't caused any physical harm, but I want to ensure he understands the severity of his actions and never repeats them. Darlene managed a small smile. I didn't expect to see that today. But it's a nice smile. Please don't lose it. I know this is a tough time for you and Joey. Promise me that if you need anything or just want to talk, you'll call me. I'm not a bad guy. I care about helping you. I'll be focused on my work for a while to process everything. You've gone from a complete family to a single parent with a young child, I said. That's a big change. My life won't change as much. I have my family's support, and I'll get by with their help. You might need to decide if you should kick Mark out or move out yourself. It would be better to stay for Joey, but I understand you might not be able to afford the house. Talk it over with your family. They know your situation better and can offer more objective advice. I will, Darlene said. In the meantime, make it clear to Mark that he's no longer welcome. I'm serious about helping you and Joey. It could be therapeutic for me as well. No strings attached. As we returned to the room, we heard raised voices. Mark and June were arguing. Why did you pull my balls off? I can't believe you did that. Mark said. He made me do it. I had no choice. June replied. I didn't see him force you, I interjected. Your actions led to this. You both got what you deserved. Mark, your actions made for divorce lawyers happy, but they left your spouses and child very sad. This is the first time since we've been married that I'm actually glad we don't have a child. Cliff, please reconsider. I'll try hard, I said. You made what should have been an easy decision difficult. You hesitated, I said. Part of you still wanted both of us. That might work for people who cheat, but it won't work for me or Darlene. We both understand that for any relationship to have a chance, there must be love, trust, and respect. Maybe you think you love us, but we don't feel there's any respect or trust left. The reality of the situation finally seemed to hit her, and she collapsed, sobbing uncontrollably. I hoped they would find the happiness they thought they would have together because Darlene and I were done with him. Period. I gave them a quick look and told them to forget what I had said about my job and my power of suggestion. I told them to remember today's events, including the impact of their actions, and that Mark should publicly acknowledge their wrongdoing. Mark should not contest the divorce. Darlene spoke up. Joey needs to be picked up from the sitter, and I need to get home. Mark, I don't know where you'll be sleeping tonight, but it won't be with me. Don't come home tonight. When you find a place to stay, we'll arrange to get your things out of here. Goodbye, Mark. Cliff, hooker, she said, 
grabbing her purse and walking out the door. Mark yelled after her and started to run out, but he remembered his lack of attire and ran upstairs to get dressed. Thirty seconds later, he was mostly dressed and out the door. I turned to June. Don't just sit there. Get dressed and get out. You have ten minutes, or I will throw your things onto the front lawn. I glanced at my watch. The timer is running. You better get going. June looked at me with pleading eyes. Seeing no sympathy, she slowly rose and went upstairs to pack. Eleven minutes later, she came down the stairs, sniffling. Where am I supposed to go? What am I supposed to do? She asked. You should have thought about that before you had your affair, I replied. You are no longer my problem. It hurts me to say this, but there has been enough pain today. I had to do this to make a cleaner break for both of us. I called your dad to come get you. He should be here soon. Oh no, what did you tell him? Did you tell him why? She asked. No, I didn't tell him anything. I'll let you explain that. I told him to come get you because you won't be staying here anymore and you need a place to live. Once you're settled, call me to arrange for the rest of your things. Cliff, don't you love me anymore? She asked, tears in her eyes. I took a deep breath. Yes, I still love you, and that's what makes this so painful. I loved you with everything I had, and that intense emotion can't just be turned off. I can't live with you anymore, and I believe that, with time, we'll both be better off apart. It may hurt more at first, but I think it would be best to see each other as little as possible for the next year or so, to heal and move on with our lives. I'll see a lawyer and start the divorce procedure tomorrow. With the prenup, it should be straightforward. Please don't try to fight this, it will only prolong the pain. June stood there with her puffy, sad eyes, sniffing as she considered my words. I wasn't sure if she was beginning to agree or still trying to find a way to change my mind. The doorbell rang, and I opened it expecting to see Jim, my father-in-law. Instead, he brought Mary, her mother. June ran into her mother's arms, crying openly. If you've done anything to hurt her, you'll be sorry you ever breathed, Jim said, his voice calm but carrying a serious threat. He was the type who could make a threat without raising his voice, and it was taken very seriously. Jim, I haven't touched her. Her suitcases are right there. She'll explain what happened when she can stop crying. You're kicking her out? What did she do to deserve this? Jim asked. I'd rather she tell you herself. It's too painful for me to go through it again, I replied. June and her mom headed to the car, with Jim picking up her suitcases and keeping an eye on me. After he left, I sank into my recliner and broke down. I cried myself to sleep, only waking when the sun shone through the bay window the next morning. It was time to get a shower and start the rest of my life. I called my boss to take the day off and then contacted the lawyer. I took care of all the standard tasks, including closing our joint accounts and opening new ones. The divorce proceeded smoothly and quickly, as she didn't contest it. A month later, I still hadn't heard from Darlene, so I called her. She and Joey had moved back in with her parents, who had plenty of room and were welcoming. They had put their old house on the market. Mark and June found a small apartment together, but Darlene mentioned that they seemed to argue frequently. Darlene asked me about the hypnotic suggestion I had given Mark and June. Is it permanent? Will he always believe he has nothing there? Never underestimate the power of denial, I said with a chuckle. After a few years, and with some convincing from doctors or others, he might start questioning his belief and possibly dispel the illusion. But then again, maybe not. It's not a topic many of us discuss openly. Now that the pain had lessened, I felt a bit of pity for him. Did you really have to do that? Darlene asked. I just smirked. I had become an adopted uncle to Joey and a casual friend with benefits to Darlene. Every couple of weeks, we would meet up. I would have liked a more serious relationship, but she wasn't interested. Too many bad memories, I suppose. 
When I attended Joey's fourth birthday party, I noticed the man I didn't know. I asked Darlene if she had a new friend, and she confirmed that she did. I told her I didn't want to intrude and that she knew how to reach me if needed. She was married to him seven months later. The presence of this new friend at the party was a sign for me to start dating again. I began seeing a nice woman I met at the mall. We've been together for several months now, and I'm starting to trust her, though I'm more suspicious than I'd like to be because of my past experiences. It had been 14 months since the divorce when I ran into Mark at the grocery store. Ironically, he told me that due to his inability to satisfy June, she had cheated on him, and he had kicked her out, much like what happened with me. I felt some sympathy for him, knowing exactly what he was going through. So, Mark, do you think you've learned your lesson? I asked. What lesson are you talking about? He replied. Will you ever cheat or have sex with a married woman again? I pressed. I wouldn't even if I could, he said. My ex-wife is constantly angry with me and keeps me from seeing Joey as much as I should. The girlfriend I cheated with also cheated on me, and now I'm alone, eating TV dinners every night. Sometimes I wonder why I keep going on. I can't even find solace in the usual ways. I'm sorry for the part one played in the affair, I said. You need to keep going because Joey needs you, even if you made mistakes. I know some people who can help with your situation in a way you won't even notice. I can't promise anything, but I'll see what they can do for you. On Friday night, drink some whiskey and pass out in bed. When you wake up, you might find a pleasant surprise. Promise me you won't mention this to anyone, I added. I promise I won't say a word. Good. And if I find out you've cheated again or had relations with a married woman other than your wife, I'll come by and make sure you don't have that issue again. I understand, he said. Thank you, Cliff. If this works, I'll owe you one. If you ever need anything, I'll be there for you. You have no idea how much I've suffered. Let's see if they can help you before you do something drastic, I said. Remember, keep this to yourself. I gave him a knowing look as I walked away, hinting that his equipment would be back, though he'd have a hangover too. About six weeks later, I ran into Jim and Mary at the mall. I was about to just wave and move on, but Jim wanted to speak with me. Cliff, I'd like a word, if I may. I shrugged. Sure, go ahead. Mary and Jim wanted to express their regret about the situation. Jim said he felt it was partly his fault due to their reaction to her pregnancy. They wanted to apologize and hope that could forgive them. Jim, Mary, you didn't make her do anything. It's true you could have been more supportive, but I know you were trying to do what you thought was right. Hindsight is always clearer. I hold nothing against you, so there's no need to apologize. Thanks, Cliff. We appreciate that, Jim said. We also want to let you know that we sent her to a therapist. Initially, it was to help her deal with the aftermath of the affair, but she had a lot of issues to work through. She's getting better. The therapist suggested it would be beneficial if you could attend one of her sessions. You don't have to be there if you prefer not to, but it would help her. I understand, I said, knowing it meant revisiting old wounds. I'll think about it. Jim and Mary left, and I took a moment to reflect on everything. She doesn't even have to be there if you want. I know it means reopening old wounds, but it would aid her recovery, and that's important to Mary and me. Do you think you could do that for us? I stared at them for a moment, taking in their sincere and hopeful expressions. They were good people who had made mistakes, just as I had. Despite everything, their friendship still meant something to me. I sighed. Let me know when and where, and I'll do my best to be there. Their faces lit up with relief. Thank you so much, Cliff. We'll call you as soon as she schedules it with Dr. Faraday. Her regular session is tomorrow, but can you make it next Thursday at 4? We made the arrangements, and as luck would have it, I was able to attend. I arrived at the office five minutes early and found June waiting in the anteroom on the couch. She smiled pleasantly, 
but there was a reserved quality to her demeanor. She seemed unsure of her standing with me and didn't want to overstep. Hello, Cliff, she greeted, her voice warm. You're looking well. She was dressed in a navy skirt and jacket with a white blouse underneath, buttoned conservatively, a professional look that subtly hinted at familiarity without revealing anything explicit. June, you look as good as I've ever seen you. This doctor must be helping. Thank you. I really appreciate you coming today. It means a lot to me and my parents. I just want to be honest and let you know that this isn't going to lead to reconciliation. I can't live like that. I understand. I've prepared myself for that, though I'd be lying if I said a small part of me doesn't still hope for us. I guess you've heard about Mark and me? Yes. And please don't take this the wrong way, but it didn't surprise me. You've always had a high sex drive, and with Mark not being able to meet those needs, it seemed like you were bound to struggle. I understand. Dr. Faraday has helped me understand why I acted out the way I did with you and Mark. He's helped me address a lot, including my pregnancy and miscarriage. We believe that was a major factor in my behavior. I'm not sure how much I can help you now. It feels like part of a 12-step program where I'll admit the mistakes I made, apologize, and try to make things right if possible. It's a healing process for me to forgive myself, so you can, if that's even possible. I thought the 12-step program was for addictions, I said. It is, she replied. I realized that I was struggling with sex addiction. After Mark and I broke up, I went out every night, picking up strangers, sleeping with anyone who showed interest. I was often drunk, and between the alcohol and the sex, I ignored the pain. My parents found out and got me help. Luckily, I didn't contract anything serious. I'm much better now and haven't been involved in any sexual activity for over three months. The room fell silent as I processed this revelation. Just then, the doctor arrived and ushered us into his office. The session was intense, but afterward, I felt a profound sense of emotional release. Cliff, thank you again for coming today. June said as we exited the building. Would you be open to having coffee or a meal together? I don't think so, not today. I've had enough turmoil for now. I want you to know that I feel bad about how things ended between us, especially since you struggled so much. Maybe someday we can be friends, but not right now. I understand, Cliff. I would like us to be friends eventually. You mean a lot to me. As we stepped out, she headed toward her car, and I headed in the opposite direction. I'm parked this way, so I guess this is goodbye. Good luck with your recovery. I gave her a quick peck on the cheek and walked towards the setting sun. June watched my silhouette receding, a tear rolling down her cheek as she saw me walk out of her life one last time. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.